When most people think about death row, they think of Suge Knight. It was once believed that Suge Knight alone was responsible for bringing some of rap's biggest superstars together and generating over $400 million in sales. But in the years since the label's downfall, it's been revealed that there was another man behind the infamous death row. A man they call Michael Hario Harris. Michael Harris was born on September 20th, 1961. He grew up on 46th Street located on the east side of South Central Los Angeles. Harris was raised by a single mother who worked two jobs giving him the best childhood she could. As a kid, Harris was described as being intelligent and a fast learner. In elementary and junior high school, he was active in the band, playing the piano, trombone, and the drums. In his college years, he enjoyed acting and was involved in various school plays and script writing. It was clear at a young age that Harris had an eye for business. After leaving Los Angeles Community College, he opened his first business, a music studio called The Jingle Factory, that specialized in creating radio commercials for local LA businesses. He had also become affiliated with the Bounty Hunter Bloods, a street gang in Watts, California. It was the early 1980s and gangs and drugs were taking over the streets of Los Angeles. Many young men at the time were getting into the drug business, with Harris being one of them. He has said in interviews that he does not consider himself a drug dealer, but rather a person who decided to sell drugs. Harris was in his early 20s when he made the decision to start selling crack cocaine. He picked up the nickname Harry O and quickly became a major player in the drug trade. Working with his younger brother, the two conquered the LA market and then expanded to the entire country. Harris connected with Colombian suppliers and regularly sent pounds of cocaine to Arizona, Texas, Michigan, and other parts of the US, making him a multi-millionaire by the age of 26. Although Harris had become one of the biggest drug dealers at the time in the United States, that was not his end goal. He wanted to eventually get out of the drug game and go legit. He attempted to do this by investing in legitimate business ventures. He purchased real estate and put his money into various businesses such as a hair salon, a deli, a car dealership, an electrical company, and a 20 fleet limousine service. Harris also stepped again into the entertainment industry. Using his skills he learned in college, he became the first African American to produce a Broadway play that starred Denzel Washington. Producing plays and owning businesses, Michael Harris was far from the average 1980s drug dealer. He was from the streets, but he knew how to move like a corporate executive, easily shifting from drug deals with gang members to professional meetings with businessmen. Those who ran in his circle looked up to him and saw him as a mentor. He taught the importance of being an entrepreneur and showed how to focus on investing one's money into lucrative deals, as he did. In fact, Harris had his hands in so many business ventures that he was also nicknamed the Octopus because he was involved in so many different ways to make money. But after only five years at the top of his game, it all came crashing down in 1987 when the 26-year-old Harris was arrested and charged with kidnapping and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. The DEA seized his $1.1 million hilltop mansion in LA's San Fernando Valley and several of his assets, including two Los Angeles homes and five luxury cars, totaling $3.2 million. Following his conviction, Harris reportedly hired California attorney David Kinner to oversee his appeal and work to get him out of jail on probation. Around this same time, Suge Knight was busy working to get Death Row Records up and running. Death Row was an up-and-coming label, and although Suge Knight had Dr. Dre and the DOC as his partners, he lacked the big money needed to push a successful record label. And that is where Michael Harry O. Harris enters the picture. It had been four years since Harris was sentenced to prison, but even behind bars word was getting around about Suge Knight and Death Row Records. Always the businessman, Harris was interested in investing some of his own money and becoming a part of Death Row. Although much of Harris's assets had been seized during his arrest, there was still a large piece of his fortune that was proven to be completely legal and not earned with drug money or money laundering. In 1991, he told his attorney David Kinner that he had heard about Suge Knight and Death Row Records and asked Kinner to contact Suge. Kinner then brought Suge Knight to meet Harris in prison, and there, they cut a deal. Harris would set up a multimedia company called Godfather Entertainment, and it would serve as the parent company of Death Row. Through Godfather Entertainment, Harris would invest $1.5 million into the Death Row label in exchange for 50% of the company. Because California law prohibits anyone in prison from running a company, 
Paris became a silent partner, allowing for only Suge Knight's name to be on the death row paperwork. And David Kenner became the lawyer for both death row and Godfather Entertainment. After the deal was done, Harris attempted to protect his investment with help from his wife, Lydia Harris, who became CEO of Godfather Entertainment and a huge part of the entire business arrangement. Harris had met Lydia in 1985 while at a nightclub in Houston, Texas, and the two were later married inside California's Tehachapi Prison. Initially, Harris planned to use his connection with Death Row to further his wife's singing career but it quickly became apparent that Lydia Harris would have no time to record albums, as watching over her husband's $1.5 million investment became a full-time job. The infusion of cash from Michael Harris made Death Row Records a major player in the music business. In a party to celebrate the label's new beginning, both Suge Knight and David Kenner thanked Harris for his involvement with Death Row. And uh, with a lot of help from Suge Knight and uh, Harry O and a number of people, and we got it all together. A move that would later cost Suge Knight in court. The first album off Death Row Records was Dr. Dre's The Chronic, distributed by Interscope Records. It was a huge success, the first of many, as Death Row went on to release The D.O.C., Snoop Dogg, The Dog Pound, and Tupac, just to name a few. Things were going well during those early years of Death Row. Harris and Suge had regular phone conversations, and Quee developed a brother type of friendship. But just three years later, things changed. Death Row was selling millions of records, but was also attracting a lot of negative attention in the process. Harris warned Suge Knight about the dangers of mixing gang activity with business, but Suge didn't listen. Eventually, their regular phone conversation slowed down, and although Death Row was making millions of dollars, neither Harris nor his wife Lydia saw any royalty money. And David Kenner, Harris's attorney, was no longer focused on the investment from Godfather Entertainment or on getting Harris out of prison. Instead, Kenner became the full-time defense attorney for Death Row Records, working exclusively with Suge Knight, and Michael Harris was completely cut out of the picture. But Harris was not about to go away quietly. In 1996, after years of waiting for money that never showed up, Harris issued a letter to Death Row distributor Interscope Records, threatening to file a lawsuit if he was not compensated for his initial $1.5 million investment. Interscope settled without a lawsuit having to be filed and paid out Harris's wife Lydia $300,000. Around this same time, Suge Knight had been arrested and charged with violating his parole during the Las Vegas MGM brawl with Tupac. Suge was found guilty and sentenced to nine years in prison. Soon after, the FBI came knocking at the door of Death Row Records. Suge Knight's reckless behavior at Death Row had caused federal agents to start looking into the rumors that Suge and Death Row were linked to street gangs, drug trafficking, and money laundering. The federal government even contacted Michael Harris behind bars, offering him a deal that would grant him early release from prison if he agreed to testify against Suge Knight and say that Suge was in fact involved in illegal activities. Harris declined the deal, saying, I would rather die than snitch. As Suge Knight sat behind bars, Death Row's money continued to pile in. And by this time, both Suge and David Kinner had publicly denied Harris giving them any startup money. So, in 2002, Lydia Harris filed a civil lawsuit against Death Row Records, claiming that although Interscope had paid out $300,000, Death Row CEO Suge Knight still owed her millions in unpaid profits and royalties. Suge denied all allegations against him, even claiming he'd never met Lydia Harris before. But the courts didn't believe him, and Lydia Harris won her lawsuit against Death Row. By the time the case was settled in early 2005, Michael Harris had already spent over 17 years in prison, and his appeal for an early release had been denied. Still, Harris was awarded $107 million from the civil court judgment filed by his wife Lydia, confirming her claims that she had co-founded Death Row Records with the $1.5 million seed money provided by her husband Harris. Later that same year, Lydia and Michael Harris divorced in a California civil court, with the two agreeing to split the money they had won. However, the very next year, in 2006, it was clear that Suge Knight and Death Row Records were unable to pay the full amount. Suge Knight was forced to file bankruptcy, and Death Row Records was auctioned off for $24 million. It's been reported that since the trial, Michael Harris and Lydia have only received $1 million from the lawsuit, and it's expected that neither one will ever see the rest of the money that's owed to them. After the sensationalized trial between Harris and Death Row Records ended, the news coverage quieted down, and Harris proceeded to finish out the rest of his prison sentence. But in 2019, Harris was back in the news when it was announced that after 31 years behind bars, 
Michael Harris, the co-founder of Death Row Records, was coming home. But as media outlets flooded the internet with social media headlines of his release, many failed to acknowledge the fact that it had been 28 years since Harris had entered into that infamous agreement with Suge Knight, and that Harris was now, in his own words, a changed man. In an interview with the Daily Mail, Harris said, Over 30 years ago I was part of the problem. However, over the years I have repeatedly proven myself to be a part of the solution. Harris recognizes the fact that his experience with Death Row has made him somewhat of a celebrity, and that he now has the opportunity to use his platform to give back. Michael Harris says he hopes to take his wisdom back into the streets, so he can share what he's learned to help heal broken communities. Only time will tell what Harris will do in his next chapter of life, but there's no question that wherever he goes, he will always be known as Michael Harry O'Harris, the man behind Death Row Records.